It's Monday, so that must mean it's time for a new episode of Tour Talk, and this week we are delighted to have Carla Harvey from The Butcher Babies on the show. We find out what it's like for her still getting starstruck at meeting her idols backstage, which actually leads us on to an incredible story where Carla got to spend an entire evening hanging out with Mick Jagger. How cool is that? We also talk about the times we've ended up in places that we shouldn't have been backstage, hosting pizza parties, how to make the most of your free time on tour, and we also look forward to Carla's first full tour back on the road, which will see the band playing their debut album Goliath in full, which is going to be awesome. Oh, and somehow we even end up talking about our love for Tesco meal deal sandwiches when on the road in the UK. New episodes of Tour Talk go live every Monday, so please subscribe, comment and like if you enjoy what you hear, and help us spread the word by continuing to share this with anyone you think will enjoy. This is Tour Talk. Welcome to Tour Talk, and thank you so much for giving us some your time, Carla. I'm, I really do appreciate yeah. it. Um, no I thought we'd kick off. Can you remember when we first met? Gosh, when did we? I don't remember. I don't know how long you were with Anthrax. I don't know when you started with them, but obviously on an Anthrax tour. <laughs> yeah. So it was quite cool for me because it was the first award show that I'd ever worked in the States. Um, but it's quite funny. So I'd flown into the States the night before on that long haul flight. We'd been working all day, kind of setting up the show because Anthrax were receiving an award as well as playing the event. Um, and I had to come and like escort Charlie over to the, the show. <laughs> so I turned up having worked all day, feeling pretty terrible. And I come and meet you and Charlie looking super glamorous, all suited and booted and ready to go on the red carpet. And I was just like, oh, this is what it's really like at an award show. <laughs> oh, so it must have been Revolver. Yeah, then. that's the one, the Loudwire one. Then the one in New York City. No, no, it was in LA. I'm pretty sure it was in LA. Oh, okay. Oh gosh, so many, so many award shows. So <laughs> time, right. Yeah, completely. <laughs> that okay. If it was the one in LA, that was a fun night. I was wearing a floor length lace dress and like a crown, and I felt very fancy that night. Yeah, for sure. you were <laughs> definitely very fancy, and I was like in all blacks, really scruffy having scrubbed it all day. So, um, yeah, I remember it very well. <laughs> but that was such a cool event because within, I think, maybe an hour of being there, I'd met Tony Iommi, Rob Halford, and Sammy Hagar. I mean... Yeah, I have a great picture of me and Tony Iommi from that night, and it was, like, just magical to go up to him and ask for a picture. <laughs> Whenever I feel shy to ask for a picture... Charlie asks for me, which is very helpful because, <laughs> you know, he knows all those, those type of cool people. So you can kind mm -hmm. of finesse a picture for me. But that was a really exciting moment for me. I missed the Sammy Hagar opportunity because I had to go do something else, like give an award away. And I was so mad. <laughs> <laughs> do you still get nervous and shy about like asking people? I mean, you must have been on so many tours with so many cool people. You like know, you. I've been lucky enough to tour the world with so many awesome people you know our very first tour uh was with a big tour was with marilyn manson and when we told our mm -hmm. label we had some ideas for who we wanted to tour with we told them marilyn manson maybe rob zombie bands like that and they're like okay well don't get your hopes up too high don't get too excited and mm -hmm. guess what we got we got all those tours that so was really <laughs> cool and uh, another fun one for me was Danzig because I was a huge uh, wow. Misfits and Danzig fan mm -hmm. growing up. And so, yeah, it, I've met so many people. And, uh, you know, even my boyfriend is you know, someone that I looked up to when I was very young as well. But there's it's funny, the people that I do get starstruck around, it's not always the people that you'd expect it. Maybe a random guy from a from a punk band like I, I saw Animal from, um, it, you know, backstage and at um, gosh, where was I? Download Festival and uh, from the Anti Nowhere League. And mm -hmm. uh, I ran up to him and I was so excited. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're one of my favorite bands. And he turns and looks at me and goes, and now you've stepped in my piss because he was actually <laughs> taking a leak when I ran up to him. But I was so excited to see him. I didn't even notice. So. Wow. Yeah. But it's like, <laughs> it's like weird, random people like that. I love seeing Ice T out. I always get um, starstruck by him. And mm -hmm. <laughs> he's such, so cool. Him and Coco are so cool. But you know um it's good it's awesome to be around people and consider them your your peers now but i think no one should ever lose the magic of 
seeing someone that they were, you know, influenced by as a kid and getting butterflies um, and wanting to, you know, getting that, the nerves, you know, too nervous to go talk to them. I think that's a really special feeling that I never want to lose. No, completely. I mean, me and Nate have talked about it a little bit before and we're terrible at it. Um, like I was lucky enough to, to go backstage with the foos and I was taking photos of everybody else with Dave Grohl, but like, I couldn't be like, uh, can I, can I have a turn now? Is that okay? Is that cool? And there was no way I was going to ask Tony Iommi for a photo. I, I get that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd say the biggest people that I've ever met, I haven't asked for a photo because I felt it was inappropriate. Um, and that I, um, had the opportunity to hang out with Mac, Mick Jagger one night all night no long. Way. Um, and it was just me and him and um, Steve Bing, who recently passed and Steve Bing had called me and said, Hey, uh, Mick Jagger's here. They were like really great friends. And he's like, do you want to come meet Mick Jagger? This is years ago now. And he, and I said, no, I, no, I don't know. I'm cool. I don't want, I felt weird about it. I'm like, what, what's this? It seemed like a weird <laughs> setup. And he's like, come on, you're a musician and you don't want to meet Mick Jagger. And so I went and it ended up being this really magical evening. And um, I sang a little while Mick Jagger played uh, piano and we talked about Get Detroit. Out. And, and um, it was just like a magical night that didn't need a photo or proof because yep. um, it was a moment that I would never forget. And I feel like I would have cheapened the moment to ask for a photo after spending such a cool evening that I would never forget with someone. I, I feel like everybody nowadays needs the photos and trust me, I love taking photos of people. I'll never get sick of that, but yeah. there's just certain times when it's inappropriate. And I, I think that you do ruin uh, something that could be very special um, by asking. The, the other time was when I met Axel Rose. I didn't ask for a picture. I had wanted to meet Axel Rose since I was 11 years old and you know, I, and a lot of times people are weird about taking pictures. They don't want to take pictures. So I didn't want to be that person to peer pressure someone into taking a yeah. photo with me. <laughs> wow. Nate, I mean, obviously you're a huge Stones fan. Do you want to ask Carl anything about hanging out with Mick Jagger? I don't want to, I feel like embarrassed just he, like just hearing about it. Like it's giving, making me <laughs> nervous, you know, like, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was nervous. No, I, right. I, I, so I, I'm on the same page as you. Generally, <laughs> like, I just, I agree with you wholeheartedly about having the photo, and, and it, it should just be a story that you tell back to people. And if you're, if you're credible, which you are as a, a musician, then it, that that story is, e it's even more special without, the, without the photo. I think. Yeah, no, I, I think so too. And if somebody doesn't want to believe you, they don't have to believe you. <laughs> you don't need proof. <laughs> but I do feel like, you know, that the photos things are, are just like a pump for your ego to make and post on your social media and say, yeah, I did this. But a lot of us, we're so anxious for that photo that we forget to just live in the moment and have that, that bit of intimacy with whoever that we're with saying, you know, thank you for uh, inspiring me. And uh, it was a pleasure to meet you. Totally. Uh, for me, it, it's almost like, I just need that photo just to just to convince myself the next day and remind myself that, yeah, that did actually happen. That wasn't a dream. Pat Smear definitely gave me some pizza. It was cool. That was a real <laughs> thing. I to and I, like I said, I totally get that. And I, I do love my photos. <laughs> mm. So turn it the other way around. Are you always super cool to take photos with people? Like you'll never... Yeah. You know, I only had a fit one time when someone asked me for a photo because sometimes... When you go to your merch booth and there's a, another band on stage, especially when you're the, you know, the opening band and there's the headliner on, you're not supposed to take pictures of people um, because it, it takes away from what's going on on stage. And then if you take a picture with one person, suddenly you've got a big crowd around you that wants to take more and more pictures. And so um, I remember at once I told somebody, uh, I can't take a picture right now, but I will later, I promise. And instead he took his phone and he went like that right in my face, super close up and oh, took a wow. picture. And I got so mad because, you know, it was something that we could really get in trouble for actually, you know, like taking photos and being rude while mm -hmm. the, the headliners on stage it was one of our first tours. And I was so mad that I, that I threw his phone. Um, and uh, I, but you know, I just feel like give people space. And if they say, I'll get to you in a moment, um, you know, do that. But I'm, I'm usually like all smiles, ready to take a picture. I, I really don't care. I don't care if I have on makeup. I don't care <laughs> how I'm dressed. I'm always happy to take a photo yeah. if it means 
something to someone, just, you know, ask and be polite about it. Yeah, completely. I am just thinking back to that um, award show and moments of like not asking to take photos. I am so a lot of those theaters like in, in the middle of LA in the middle of cities all the parkings underneath and the bands come in underground and then they get an elevator up to to one of the other levels so i was running around downstairs um sorting something out to do with the truck or whatever and i was running for this elevator to get back to the the band's dressing room and it was kind of closing but i like i thrust my hand in there cuz i needed to get there and i walked in the elevator and i didn't really think about it um until i kind of looked around and i was in an elevator with just me and avenge sevenfold and i was like oh <laughs> I really shouldn't be in this elevator. <laughs> um, have you ever ended up in places that you shouldn't have been <laughs> on tour like well, that's that? That's a loaded question. <laughs> right there. No, I mean, I feel like the the when you end up somewhere that you're not supposed to be, you just act like you're supposed to be there. You know, everyone is just a human being at the end of the yeah. day. Um, and that awkwardness kind of just lives in our head a little bit. So if I find myself, you know, in an elevator with someone, I would just say, hello, how are you guys? Mm -hmm. And most of the time, they don't know who the fuck you are. You could, you could be in some, you know, That's famous it. band, maybe even bigger than Event Sevenfold. <laughs> they don't know. They don't know who the fuck you are. <laughs> I just remember thinking they were all really tall. Like, I was just quite surprised. I was like, actually, you guys are, you guys are pretty tall. That's, that's cool. Um, I should get out they're, this elevator They're California now, grown, I think. That's why it's the sunshine. <laughs> Nate, I can well imagine you've been somewhere you shouldn't. I mean, I, there's more places that I shouldn't have been than <laughs> designated areas on tour that I should should have been. Um, yeah, I feel like every festival by accident, I end up just in a situation where I'm like in someone's area where I'm I'm for sure not supposed to be, and it's a, it's a ter it's actually a ter quite a terrible feeling. Why? Everyone's cool at festivals, right? No, absolutely not. No, I've definitely had, I've definitely, I've definitely had, I definitely have been in a common area that's clearly designated, especially in, in, in Europe, I've been in a common area where mm -hmm. um, it's marked, you know, it's marked common area and I'll be there and a tour manager or, or an assistant will come up and be like, we need you to kind of leave, leave this area. But I, I, you know, I, but I know where I am on the totem pole. I don't ever... <laughs> I don't ever feel like I'm putting up a fight. I'm just like, all right, I'll, I'll, I think I'm supposed to be I here. had, I, I had the I'll reverse move. of this happen one time to me and Heidi. We were backstage at one of the big festivals in Europe. It was, um, what, like, what are the ones out there? It's like not Hellfest, but the ones around the same Copenhagen. We were at Copenhagen. Uh, wow. And there was a tent for, I guess it was, food for like the workers like crew but not the crew with the bands like the crew that just puts together the stages but it was near our stage and we decided that we were hungry and we were going to go eat catering so we're in there and everyone's staring at us and we're like this is weird and the catering was not so good it was like egg salad sandwiches and like <laughs> just piles of them and we're like okay whatever you know we'll eat whatever and then we realized that we were in you know, the, the crew crew tent <laughs> eating up all their food, like real jerks <laughs> when we should have been in our catering. But I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. Cause they, anyone... they were staring at us like, like who the hell are these broads stealing our food? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't no one say anything? No, they just stared at us like we were weirdos and we, we kind of were. And like I said, we just, <laughs> like, where, what are we doing? <laughs> That's very funny. I mean, how was the egg salad sandwich though? They're delicious. I'm telling Europe and the UK have the best egg salad sandwiches. Like I have a problem with it. When I go there every morning, I go find, I love the displays of sandwiches in the windows. I talk <laughs> about it often because I'm so fascinated by it. Cause we don't have that in the States, but when you go by a little store and there's like stacks, especially in Germany, there's like stacks of these gorgeous sandwiches and this perfect egg salad. And I get really worked up about it so i usually hunt one down every day <laughs> no i mean food is a regular topic on this um and i can imagine nate's got an opinion on an egg salad sandwich yeah there are yeah europe well first off i i'm not as high class to window shop for sandwiches i'm usually in <laughs> a uh like what's the store that we tesco. always go to? even tesco uh, has great egg salad tesco sandwiches. correct yeah. in the in the cardboard box the triangle yeah. egg salad sandwich is a staple <laughs> 
Although in England sometimes they do put corn or sh- or shrimp or pr- you know prawn in it, and it, that's quite that's that's questionable. That's up for debate in terms of what I think is like cool or not. But... It's exotic to me. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> really, corn. That's all it okay. takes oh for, it's amazing. For, and to the, impress you. Tiny shrimp and an egg salad the sandwich. Other thing, well, <laughs> the butter on the bread, too, is something that we don't do here in the States. So that was like heaven to me, too. And then they put like corn inside the tuna salad sandwiches. Yeah. I know all the sandwiches. I could give you a rundown of every sandwich they have at Tesco. I didn't think we'd end up like, yeah, <laughs> going for like a top 10 Tesco uh, meal deal sandwich i mean this is amazing well, you know when we first started touring the, the uk and europe we didn't have any money and it's a very you know it's hard you're in a sprinter van yep. and, um you know you're not going to make any money because you just got to make it to you know from city to city and do your thing and so you eat you know as lean as possible and those tesco sandwiches are lifesavers so you're a big fan of the meal deal the three pound meal deal i haven't i haven't heard of the three pound meal deal but that's something to look forward to next time i go oh for any young bands first coming over like tesco sandwiches are good and then for an extra like 70 pence you get a drink and a side of fruit or some chips or or whatever there's a there's a whole thing it's almost infamous in this country yeah it's it's you guys really have things figured out over there (laughs) it's i'm no stranger to the three pound meal deal (laughs) no no yeah, I Although, believe Dario, that. Although Dario, the last time we the last time we were in a, a van together, a sprinter in England, I remember specifically getting um what was supposed to be fried chicken strips pre cooked from Tesco, and then I bit into one and they were literally mm. all raw and the every single one of them was raw on the inside. <laughs> yeah. That's no good for tour. Do, I mean, do, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, that was not I should have gone egg salad. Sandwich, I mean you probably sure. should have you, yeah, you probably should have checked what you were eating too instead of just kind of like throwing it straight in there. We were very hungover, to be fair. <laughs> it's funny, that tour I remember you gave me a lot of shit because I bought a load of porridge and you thought it was the stupidest thing anybody had ever brought on tour. It's very smart in retrospect. It's, it's better than smart. raw chicken at the very least. Yeah, you have like yeah. the minute oats and you can eat those for That's breakfast today and keep you full. They keep you full to that lunchtime Tesco. It's great. That's it. That lunchtime Tesco. That's a sound bite for sure. Wow. <laughs> um, kind of sticking with that though and going to like days off. I remember, well, I think I remember like seeing a post from you a while back saying something along the lines of that you kind of just love to go and find somewhere to have a, like a cool little like cafe or coffee shop with good coffee and just kind of sit down and draw and like kind of fill your time on like whether it be days off or like pre show and stuff. Yeah, I've never. Yeah, I remember sitting there thinking, "God, I do nothing with my time. I should be way more." Really? Oh my gosh! I I have full days on tour. I wake up pretty early before almost everybody else on the bus. Mm-hmm. Sometimes my drummer um, Chase will wake up early and we'll walk to a, a coffee shop together. But I, regardless of whoever is up, I go by myself and I try to find a more like you know bougie coffee shop in Starbucks, someplace I can sit a while, have a you know a nice drink and uh, just draw mm-hmm. all day. So I do like a daily drawing every day on tour, and uh, yeah, I, I my days are like I make sure that if there's something in a city that I want to see, I'll see it. Um, I'll go to the gym, and I'll, but I spend a great deal of time just drawing in coffee shops. That's amazing. Like I had to learn that you could really make something of your time on days off. Um, if I don't, I'll go crazy or I'll get really bad habits. I I just I just know that about myself. Um, mm-hmm. I have my brain has to be occupied. When my brain's not occupied, it goes like I said, weird weird places. And <laughs> especially on tour, I always say that you kind of become institutionalized on tour, and every day is the same. Mm-hmm. And um, you can get weird unless you kind of like break your own habits and and kind of set, you know, a routine for yourself that you're going to do every day to um, keep up whatever you're doing. Yeah. I mean, is that something you had to develop that routine where you like kind of stuck in some bad habits and then you were like, no, I want to make the most of my time or. You know what? It kind of started for me on our first tours because again, when you first start touring, um, you know, it's funny because I have a, a cousin who um, is going on his first tour and he just oh. joined this band and he asked me how much money he should ask for from the band. And I was like, 
<laughs> you'll be lucky to make a dime. <laughs> um, so it's, it has to be about something that you love. And that's how it was when we started off, just like any other band. You do it because you love it and you hope that one day there will be money in it. But, uh, you know, your first tours are pretty lean and all the money goes to getting your yourselves to the next city yep. and the one after that and, you know, getting more merch to sell. So personal money um, is hard to come by. So I've always drawn and I've always written. And so um, that first tour, I started selling my drawings so that I could make ends meet. And, um, you know, I started off selling one for, you know, 20 bucks or whatever. And mm -hmm. then I, I realized that these little daily drawings I do at the coffee shop, I can feed myself so I won't, you know, die of, of hunger on the road. <laughs> and, um, you know, it just helps keep me going as it because I'm the whole thing about my band, too. It's like we weren't kids when we started off. We were we'd all come from different parts of the country to be rock stars. You know, I mm -hmm. came to L.A. when I was 19 from Detroit. And I wanted to be a rock star. Well, guess what? It didn't happen for me until I was 35. <laughs> so at 35, and now you know I'm significantly older than that, you can't just go on the road and not provide for yep. um, whatever you have going on at home. You have to pay your rent. Um, you're not as easily, um, you know, you can't just, when I was 20, I would have been like, all right, let's just fucking go. I'll sell everything I have and I'll go on tour. You can't do that at my age now. So there had to be a way for me to make money. So that was how I made a little bit of money for myself was by, you know, drawing. And now it's turned into, um, you know, a whole business for me. I sell um, sketchbooks that I do on tour every year. Every every drawing that I've done on tour for the whole year, I'll put in a book at the end of the year. And I've got all kinds of T-shirts and merch. And it started off, like I said, as a means just to eat just to get by so um that's been really cool i also wrote a book on our first tour about um my life um as a mortician before i was on tour mm -hmm. because like i said i knew that i had to do something to survive because music doesn't always pay the bills kids i wish it did <laughs> <laughs> it, but it doesn't doesn't automatically like down the road yes but when you're starting off um and especially if you just want to have a good attitude when you're out there on the road, you know, whatever you can do on the side to make money when you go home, you're working your ass off so you can save up more money so you can go back yep. out on the road again. That's the way it is. I don't like people who don't have that mindset. Like you, you can't just go on one tour, think you're a rock star and then not work <laughs> and, you know, jump from couch to couch when you get home. Yep. Although a lot of people do. <laughs> I mean, the whole idea of having like a little side hustle is such a great idea to to keep yourself going out there and actually, one, have something to focus on and as a way to kind of sustain yourself at the same time. I mean, especially with stuff to do with routines, Nate, I'm sure you can relate to a load of that in terms of changing your routine. I mean, obviously, you're an artist as well. I'm sure you can kind of get on board with the daily sketch thing. and Yeah, everything gets boring after a while. It's what I think people don't understand about life in general a lot is that you know, you, you say, I want to do this for a living. I want to be a rock star. I want to be an artist. I want to be an, an actress. Every fucking thing you do in life gets old, gets boring. You've got mm -hmm. bad days. There's people you don't want to deal with. Like every career has that. And the same thing applies to music. Um, and especially when you like are trapped on a bus for six weeks to eight weeks at a time. Um, and it's just, you know, but that's, there's, there's magical moments in it. There's hard moments, but you kind of like equal out the parts and usually mm -hmm. it ends up being a pretty magical experience. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, so Nate's just got back off like a 10 day tour. Um, and he's actually, I think you've tried to change like your daily routine. Am I right, Nate? Um, and try and make the most of your time. Yeah. I found this tour for the first time ever. It was just packed. I didn't. I had no downtime because I was very, very focused on finding that routine. I guess you mm -hmm. know, like you have the coffee shop and the drawing, and um, I was focused for the first time ever, like on not not drinking too much and not staying up too late and getting up in the morning and doing some kind of exercise and actually trying to find um, a consistent place for coffee every day and like warming up hours before the set and just thinking about every little detail and then by the time the show came it my day was completely chocked full which it's been a long time since ha kind of having that experience 
yeah, I, I like that feeling of, of being busy. Um, like I said, it keeps me going. And, um, you know, especially as a vocalist, you said warming up early too. Like that. for me, the whole thing about finding things to do to occupy my brain was that I can't party a lot being a vocalist. I can't drink a lot. I can barely drink anything on the road, to be honest, um, because it affects my voice so much. So it, I had to do these things that were positive things to mm -hmm. kind of, you know, not let myself go into that territory of like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to drink Jägermeister all night again. Yeah. And I, I found myself. So, so I have a, I have a vocal warm that takes about 15 or 20 minutes and I started doing it in the morning and then before sound check and then actually was doing it three times a day. And it made such a difference in the actual vocal performance you know I was I could push it way harder and way further every night that I spent more time warming up and then the next day became easier and easier and that's the opposite of, of any experience I've ever had on tour leading up to this tour usually you know you hit day seven and you're like fuck I, my voice is like you know it's 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 being ground down to a fine powder and now I, f I felt like I could have done tw 10 more shows in a row no no stress at all but I get, you know, it, 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 it took me 18 years to find that, to find that balance. Yeah. It's, it's hard when you're starting off. What, adv what advice would you have for, for what advice would you have for vocalists? Um, drink lots of water all day long, drink lots of tea all day long. I love the warming, warming up so, three times a day. Sounds awesome. And just obviously don't do drugs. Don't drink excessively. Don't drink wine. Don't drink, you know, whiskey. The only thing I drink on tour is Jägermeister and it sounds oh. so gross, but I love Jaeger and it's the only thing that I can have, you know, a couple shots of a night because it kind of coats your throat a little bit, but you know, um, you can't put your, your voice in a road case. We always say, and so get lots of sleep, do all, all the right things. And yeah, it gets a little bit boring sometimes if you can't go out and party with everybody else, but you just can't when you're a vocalist, not if you want to have a longstanding career and not if, um, if your vocals are very challenging, like we go from screaming to singing, um, we're running around on stage. Our songs are very challenging. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you have to, to know that about your set and know how many days you have to last. Like we're going, well, I can't say, <laughs> I almost spilled the beans. <laughs> I don't know, when, are, when is this gonna be out? Uh, in a couple of weeks, probably. Okay, so that's fine then. Everyone will know by then we are going on a tour. And uh, the first, we haven't toured, you know, in quite some time in the yep. first weeks back or like six days on a day off, six days oh, on. Oh, wow. So it's going to be um, hard. And I even bought like a, um, like a humidifier, personal humidifier to use mm -hmm. for my voice, because even your voice can get screwed up by going into a dry climate, say Arizona, Vegas, your voice can be trashed just by being in that environment. So you have to baby yourself a lot. And like I said, it may seem boring at times, but you have to know what's best for your voice and what you personally can handle. So, I mean, I, your, your shows are pretty physical on you, like both of you and Heidi like, specifically. I mean, have you having to think about getting yourself battle hardened again? I mean, having a year and a half out must yeah. be tough. You know, I go to the gym twice a day and I wow. sometimes I sing when I'm running. So that helps. Wow. I mean, nothing, nothing is like being on stage, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so even because you've got this adrenaline going too, and uh, there's just different, you know, climates you're in and different situations. Some nights are hotter than others, but um, and Heidi works out a ton too. So we, um, um, you know, there was moments in the pandemic where we were both out of shape, I'm sure. <laughs> Because, <laughs> you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I think everyone just sat at home and drank wine. Yeah. So then you have to kind of snap yourself out of that. And um, but I go um, I do, you know, pretty, pretty hardcore weights and cardio just to make sure that when I get back out there, I can go on stage for an hour and a half running around and singing because, you know, especially my guttural vocals they are, you know, from they come from yeah. deep in here and I need that power. Um so I don't want to go up there like a like a veal, <laughs> all out of shape. So, so singing whilst running is the the way to prep for that. Yeah, um, and and actually, like in, in uh, Army Guy taught me this years ago. 
um, he would do uh, war pigs. He would sing war pigs while the guys were doing their running, oh. um, all the army guys. And so I did that too. And it, and it fits perfectly. And uh, yeah, you have to be able to emulate that. I mean, because on stage, like I said, you're running around, yeah, jumping, are... jumping off stuff and you don't want to like be <laughs> you know, like completely out of breath. Mm -hmm. while you're doing it you want to be able to because it's not worth ruining the song just to jump off something so you have to make sure that you're physically fit enough to do everything at once for nights on end <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, i mean six in a row is is hard i mean i don't think a lot of fans would really even consider what it would be like for a band to do six and like six nights in a row have a day off and then do the same again i mean is that yeah. usually what you would do on a tour or is that quite extreme um, well, it's we like to do like four days, yeah. maybe five. So this is going to be a bit more intense, but um, you know we'll make it work. Uh, yeah, I don't think people realize how hard it is to to do it, especially like I said with different varying conditions of um, discomfort. As far as like, is it 110 degrees in this city? Is it you know? Is it um, Colorado and you can't? You can't breathe when you're on stage because of the mm -hmm. difference in the air. Um, so it, there's just all these, like, like I said, varying circumstances that lead to your show being harder or easier. And, um, you know, you just got to make sure that you're in tip top shape every day and uh, to prepare for it. Wow. I am. So is there anything that you guys have been working on in your time off to like make the show bigger or better or is there something different going on just new music we've been we've been writing so much new music we've got another song coming out um late july i believe and yeah it's it's just exciting to um to release new stuff you know at the beginning of the pandemic we had a plan for yep. we had a tour that we were going on we had music we were releasing and then everything changed so we had to kind of like navigate this new world and kind of figure out when we could release stuff. So we've been releasing about a, a song about every month now. And mm -hmm. um, it's been awesome. And we're actually doing something really special for this tour. We're taking it back. We're throwing it back to our very first album, which is probably our most beloved album. It's called Goliath. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a whole Goliath set front to back. And then a couple of these new songs that we've been writing in between. And it's going to be awesome. Amazing. So are you actually playing the album front to back? Because I've been on a couple of those tours where bands will play the album in full, but they'll switch it up. Or are you playing it from start to finish? We're, we're playing it from start to finish, awesome. um, which is how I would like to see it yep. if I was, a, you know, if I was a fan, because you know, bands work really hard to put their their songs in order on the album so that it takes you on a journey. Yeah, and I think that we did that with Goliath, and so I'm really excited. I'm excited to see the people's faces when they hear their favorite song off their off our first album. Yeah. You know, that's the kind of stuff that keeps us going when you see someone's face in the crowd and in. Um, see them screaming back these lyrics that you wrote mm -hmm. it's it's awesome is there anything like you're apprehensive about about kind of getting back out there because again like nate's literally just done 10 dates and i know that i think probably until like you walked on stage there were like little moments or little things about the people with different in venues like wearing masks and stuff that was just a little bit new again almost um yeah I mean, I don't know how it's going to be until we get out there. Charlie's playing a big show um, in a couple of weeks. I'm going to go with him and I'll check it out. He's playing this big mm -hmm. rock fest show. So that'll give me a little bit of an idea. But every place is different. Um, you know, where I live here in Illinois, I live in Chicago area. There's no more masks if you're vaccinated. Um, you know, and I just I hope that people do follow rules. So there's no like if there is, I just don't want I want to be able to keep doing this i don't want the mm -hmm. world to shut down again um and i know it's become a very political thing and everyone has their views i just want everyone to be safe and healthy and um you know if that means wearing a mask somewhere wear a mask hopefully we won't have to wear masks at big shows hopefully we can still do meet and greets um but we'll see how it is out there when we go um i'm more apprehensive about just being on the road in general you know i've become very introverted here at home <laughs> i was already an introvert <laughs> And then it got worse during the pandemic. You know, we live in uh, just Charlie and I are very like we become homebodies completely. We love being at mm -hmm. home together. And we've also been able to spend the last, you know, almost couple of years now completely together all the time, 24 seven. 
So now we're going to be separated again when we go on the road. So that's going to be um, a weird. So I'm more apprehensive about that than I am apprehensive about going out into this, you know, post pandemic world to play shows, to be honest. Nate, how was it for you being back out there? Have you got anything? I was just going to say that. Yeah. I I mean, Carla, I think when you get to those shows, I think you're going to, you're just going to be blown away by people's um, people's enthusiasm is so tangible. It's it's crazy. I've never experienced anything like it. Um, people are everyone from you know you the, the the house sound guy is not grumpy anymore. It's just crazy. Like everyone from the bartenders to the patrons to the people that bought tickets six weeks ago, whatever, the, everyone is, the energy is so high and so palpable and tangible in the room that it's, it's truly like renewed my faith in like wanting to do this, you know, and, and, and there, there's naturally going to be some apprehension, but I, I think when you hit the first, after the first show, it's just, it's just going to be crazy. Yes. Like the energy from the crowd is going to be key when we go back. And I'm sure that people are just going to lose their minds. So I'm, really really excited to see uh people's faces just light up and uh that's gonna you know obviously give me a renewed love for um for doing it Uh, i already feel more excited than i usually do to go on tour you know there was a time when we were beating ourselves up on tour going you know out like 10 months out of the year and um like i was talking about earlier how everything gets old after a while um you know, being up there was like the greatest joy of my life. And then it got to a point where it's like, I mm-hmm. I don't know, this is a really hard life doing this all the time. Mm-hmm. But now that we've had so much time off, I feel mm-hmm. like everyone's going to go back with like a, a, just a, a better attitude about being out there and really excited about it again. I think it's going to be really cool to see because bands are going to be super grateful to be there again. Fans are going to be super grateful to be there again. I'm a sh- I'm sure those first few shows are just going to be melting pots of like unbridled like exuberance. It's going to be it's going to be mega. I can well imagine. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think so too. It, it's funny you, you mentioned obviously the fact that you and Charlie are both tour musicians and you've actually had a bunch of time at home. Like, I don't know the many people who are like in a relationship with another tour musician. It can't be like an easy thing to juggle all the time, especially having been used to be at home for so long. Yeah, no, it's not. Um, And I I really love to go with him on tour when he's on tour um, and I'm Mm -hmm. available to go. And so we try to be together as much as we can. But it, you know, at the end of the day, it just really sucks to not be with the person that you love every, every day. Um, I'm very attached to him. I'm very attached to waking up and having my coffee with him. And, you know, we'll see each other on the road at different festivals that we're both playing and he'll come visit Mm -hmm. and, and vice versa. But it's still, you know, usually one person is a musician and then that other person can either go out and visit a lot or yep. um, they're home waiting for you. And it's just normal. It just feels more normal. But when you're both on different ends of the earth, you know, at yeah. different times, it just it's uh, it can be a very like empty, lonely feeling sometimes. But um you know, that's the kind of life that we signed up for before we met each other. So mm-hmm. we just do the best we can to make it work and um i think that you do the best to make the other person always feel like loved and thought of and um like when we first started dating and he would be on the road and i'd play a festival and i knew he'd be there a couple days later i would leave like a note and i'd give it to oh, production wow. to make sure yeah. to give him you know just something handwritten and i just we just try to do like as many little special things as we can for each other and we make sure that the time that we do get together is fucking awesome that's amazing that's really cool um and you guys got to do a load of cool stuff during lockdown which we did we did he, um you know charlie was doing his his quarantine jams and i got to mm-hmm. be a part of a couple of those and anybody out there who hasn't heard them you got to get his silver linings album i did a tom petty song and a massive attack song and uh it was Such just really fun it, it was a a really cool experience to record those songs like in our kitchen and Charlie recorded my vocals (laughs) at home here. And, um, it was just, it was such a cool, intimate thing to do together. And then we, 
um, did a lot of artwork together during the pandemic. Yeah, that's the we real cool have, thing. I mean, yeah, so we got to have an art show together um, here in Chicago, and we're doing another art show together in New York City at this awesome gallery, August 7th and 8th. So that's going to be um, another cool thing that we get to do together before we hit the road mm-hmm. on our separate ways. But um, yeah, it's just like I've never had a partner that um, I could create music and art with at home. And it, so it really put us both in a better mental place. Like throughout the pandemic, um, we had each other to to uh, be creative with. And Mm -hmm. the times when we we would normally say be at a bar drinking or out to a dinner somewhere, we spent that time, you know, sitting next to each other, um, just drawing and um, talking about, you know, showing each other our art and talking about music and writing music together. So it was, it was a pretty magical year and a half for me. And I, you know, I, I hate saying that because I know so many people had an absolute awful time during the pandemic and it was a horrible thing for us all to have to go through but Mm -hmm. for me um and just like charlie's album says silver linings it did have this um really great um effect on my home life with him that's awesome i I got two questions on this one did you get to pick the songs that you you sang on no charlie picked them (laughs) (laughs) he's like he's very like picky about I, I said like for, for instance the massive attack song i said because uh-huh. i don't sing in a high voice and if you if you know my vocals from butcher yeah. babies i sing a very guttural voice or i scream in a guttural voice um i i can sing high but it's not like my my thing so the you know the where i'm singing at in that song is really really out of my comfort zone and mm-hmm. so um it was hard for me to 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 wrap my head around it and i begged him to like let me scream the whole song or <laughs> let me do something or let me do it like t- drop it down a lot and do like a really cool sexy voice and he's like no no i want you to do it like this and so i so i did and um but i, I feel like any time that you kind of take yourself out of your comfort zone and learn something new yeah. or try something new it's a good thing so i'm glad that i did it at the end of the day um and then the tom petty song is singing more in my range and uh, Mm. that was fun um i've always loved tom petty so that was like a really really fun one to sing that's awesome like and secondly i'm always in awe of people who can draw because i literally haven't got an artistic bone in my body when it comes to that so i've always like wondered is like the creative process similar like if you're because i know that you've been involved in comics and and you and books and all the rest of it and so is the process similar to writing songs as it is to when it comes to being artistic in that way? Um, you know, no, be, not not for me because I'm a vocalist. So my when I write a song, it's it's always collaborative. You know, I don't write mm-hmm. the music to the song. We can Heidi and I give suggestions uh, or things, but uh, we're like put a chug chug here. We're not writing the music, <laughs> so we we'll write the vocal melodies together and the the words, of course. Um, but we need the boys. Um, to to help us you know write the song to make it complete when it comes to art it's it's you know you're there by yourself and so it's a very um yeah so there's there's that that's completely different and um for me i i don't know i don't even know i don't even know how to compare the two at all but i do listen to music while i am drawing and a lot of my art um well, if I'm listening to like a Nine Inch Nail song or something, I'll draw mm-hmm. something that um, is inspired by that song. There's one album that I love listening to, and you might be surprised by it. It's called Fail. It's a Fantastic Planet by the band Failure. It is my number one favorite album to draw to because I love the lyrics so much to that album. And there's just like unlimited inspiration that I find from that album. <laughs> wow. Hey, Nate, is there anything you want to ask Carla on any of that? Um, yeah, I mean, w- when you start out to do a drawing, when you start out to do a piece, w- you know, w- what is the inspiration? Like, what I get, I guess, I guess I-, I love to draw too, but I always feel like I have a-, a goal in mind, you know, like an end piece. And I, w- where, where are you, where do, you, where do you like start and finish? Well, I think that most of my my art comes from my own life experiences to start with. You know, I was an embalmer for years. Um, so I really love anatomy. Um, a lot of my art is sex and death themed. Um, 
I was a Playboy model and a mortician at the same time. And uh, I did a TV show uh, for the Playboy channel for years. And so I feel like everything in my life is like sex and death, sex and death, hot girls and death. <laughs> so, um, but my art, I think definitely um, uh, shows that. And I've always been, since I was a little girl, I've loved comic books and when in the night I loved Robert Williams, loved Robert Crumb. I've always loved um, kind of smutty comics and I love, um, you know, uh, the nineties image comics with the girls, with the, the, they call them like broke back bitches because they have like these <laughs> um, impossible bodies that with like yeah. backs that don't even, <laughs> don't work. Um, but big boobs, big butts. And so I've always been really attracted to drawing stuff like that. So um, most of my art is, um, you know, kind of um, just uh, lowbrow illustrations of women or very detailed anatomical <laughs> kind of art. Um, so it's it's all a different thing, but definitely most of it is like sex and death themed. Um, I had one more thing about touring. I forgot to mention it before. Um, because I've run meet and greets and VIP stuff for bands along the way. I've never hosted a pizza party. The only problem with the pizza parties is that, like, at the end of the night, the whole band would be staring at the pizza party, pizza, and we'd be like, Shh, "Do we eat it again?" You know, <laughs> like, I don't eat pizza. I think I gained like ten pounds on that tour eating pizza every night. Uh, yeah. um, no, it, you know what? It was such a fun thing, and yeah, I bet. the next time we did it, we didn't do the pizza, but the first time we did, we even had like a pizza costume that we made them put on, and they took pictures with us. At oh the wow, end. really? It was <laughs> completely silly. But man, you know, people hadn't had like, so I think most people don't get to go on a tour bus unless you're yep. like super, super lucky. It's like a fantasy, you know, to go on a bus. So we wanted to offer that to people where they come on the bus, they can sit with us in the front lounge. Sometimes we open the doors, they can get a peek into, you know, the back area if it's mm -hmm. not too messy that day. But um, just to sit on the bus with one of your favorite bands and eat fucking pizza isn't that cool <laughs> that's awesome I'm... and so yeah and me and I've... Heidi would be running to Domino's you know after the show like down the street like cloaked in the darkness and getting the <laughs> getting the pizzas if you know sometimes they don't deliver in certain cities so but um it was it was a really cool and then ordering the pizzas too is tricky you got to get you know your Hawaiian and your, <laughs> your pepperoni something for everybody um, but yeah, people, people were not shy about eating the pizza on the bus either with us. I don't know if I could eat it around my favorite band, you know, but they were chowing down. It was just yeah. a, a cool thing. I mean, cause I've run some VIP stuff and it's really awkward because like, if it's a stayed kind of meet and greet thing, it's hard for the band to get into it. Never mind the people. Cause they're so usually so in awe of the people that they've come to see that yeah. trying to having that whole pizza thing as a way to kind of break the ice must just be, it must make the it's, whole thing much more enjoyable for everyone. It's more of a party atmosphere, but I will say that Heidi and I, um, Henry as well, but especially Heidi and I, we really know how to break the ice people and talk to people and make people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, all of our meet and greets are really, really fun. I think we always try to do something special with people. It's never just yeah. to walk up and take a photo with us. We always like play a game or do something and uh, something fun just to give them a different experience that makes them want to do it again. You know, unfortunately, we live in a world where, you know, we have to have these meet and greets to survive because music is not the same as it was, you know, yeah. um, 20 years ago where you could make a shit ton of money um, off of your record sales and merch and this and that. So now it's a very integral part of. Um, of touring it really helps us get to the next city it helps us you know be able to be out there and i think people are understand that and um so that said we still know they're spending their hard-earned money on hanging out with us for a few extra minutes and buying a ticket to the show so we want to give them the best possible experience that we can yeah so i mean obviously the industry has changed like so much in the last 20 years because of that and I, it's doing something fun with people is an awesome way to kind of make the most of that whole meet and greet vibe I think so it's really cool and it makes them family you know it keeps yeah. them coming back because you know if you if you break bread with somebody or if you make them feel special in a meet and greet they're a fan for life they're you mm -hmm. know they're family for life after that so what are people's reactions like to being on a tour bus because it is that on that holy grail kind of thing of I've been on a tour bus with a band it's super cool but 
when you spent six weeks on one, it is quite a small, intimate space. It's it's a totally yeah, different vibe being in a band. Yeah. Everybody wants to go look at the bathroom and try the bathroom. We <laughs> <laughs> but no it's it's like little things like that that people like are so fascinated by you know and they're like mm-hmm. you live here like people i still don't think people understand that we live on the bus like there's no hotel rooms you know on a special occasion we might get a hotel room if we need to take a shower you know but yeah for the most part we're, we live on the bus and you know 12 people live on this bus all the time and people have a hard time wrapping their heads around that they think that there must be <laughs> something else to it <laughs> but um they get they get really into it you know they like to see like the microwaves <laughs> the yeah. refrigerator it's like crazy but it's just like they like to sit in the driver's seat of the bus like and and i would too you know and we're, we're very open like look at what you want to look at and um you know sit down and enjoy enjoy it and mm-hmm. because you know otherwise if you if you're lucky enough to get on a bus and you're just kind of sitting there like weird and it's awkward, but we try to make it a welcoming experience where um, they can kind of like really check things out. Do you enjoy life on a bus? You know what? I just get, you get used to it. And honestly, I never thought I'd be the kind of person to get used to it. Um, But I, you do. And I love my bunk when I'm on it. I'm so, (laughs) I'm super small. I'm only five foot two. So my bunk feels very roomy. I have a, a bunch of shit at the You've bottom. You've got space for stuff in there. Yeah, definitely. I've got so much room in there. And <laughs> you just feel like cozy. And there's times when you come back from tour, and I just, may just be weird, but I think my bandmates feel the same where you actually miss your your bunk. Because when that bus starts moving and you're going to sleep, it just kind of rocks you to sleep. And, you know, I mean, obviously life is much nicer, like in my nice home in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's not, it's not as bad as you would think as long as you do with your time what you know what you want um like I said I I feel like it's when you realize that you can get up and go see the Alamo or get up and go see Graceland your time becomes much more you know much much better yeah I mean that was the whole reason for doing it isn't to go get out there and see the world and see all this yeah see the world you may not make a lot of money but at least you can see the world (laughs) It's funny you say that about your bunk and stuff because I know that Nate almost feels like the only way he can appreciate his bed is by spending a bunch of time in a bunk on a bus and doing it that way. Yeah, I lo- I truly love it. Well, you know, I I personally like a very hard mattress, and um, so I think that I'm just weird. So I don't mind my bunk. <laughs> <laughs> and again, being small, because there's some guys that I know that tour that are like, you know, six foot five and i don't know how the hell they do it it would be the most uncomfortable thing in the world but for a five foot two girl who likes a hard mattress tour life is awesome <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna be back on the bus soon then mm-hmm. sure am um days. so our tour is about six weeks long so uh yeah getting right back into it amazing um well i hope you have an awesome time thank you very much for joining us today it's been a great to chat yeah. to you, see you again Thanks for having me, and I'll see you somewhere on the road. Yeah, <laughs> we so head hope back so. It'll be cool. Really nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. All right, we'll see. We'll catch you later. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Bye, Bye. Carl. Thank you. Bye. Congratulations on making it to the end of another episode of Tour Talk. You can keep up to date with us across the socials at Tour Talk Pod. So that's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Patreon. Please subscribe, comment, like, and share, and we will see you next week. <laughs>